السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين يا رب العالمين Everyone stand up Good Stretch a little It's okay, it's okay, it's important. You need to get the blood flowing a little bit. You've been sitting there for a long time. You know, it is Jumu'ah, so you're extra sleepy. So, everybody's good? Say salam to the person next to you. Very good, very good, have a seat. All right, this is not a, here's what I'm gonna do. I am, I'm extremely, um, I, I am really tired, I will tell you that right now. I am really tired. And when I'm tired, I end up doing pretty silly things. And so here's what I'm going to do in this lecture. I'm going to expect you to answer every question I ask, every one of you. Even if you don't know the answer, and everybody else is saying the answer, just say, hey, hey, hey. just make some noise, okay? Just so you're participating. But I need to know that you're alive, okay? As you know, when I, when I give a lecture in the United, United States, or I give a lecture in Canada, uh, you know, and I ask a question, the entire crowd answers a question. When I speak in the Muslim world and I ask a question, this is what they do. <laughs> some people start doing tasbih, some people like, astaghfirullah al This is not a khutbah, it's okay, you can talk. And this is my way of knowing that you're still alive, okay? So if I ask you a question, you will what? Oh, very good, it's already working. Okay, excellent. Alhamdulillah. This, this program, inshallah, this brief talk that I want to have with you, I will try to explain some things to you about uh, the month of Ramadan and the month that's coming. I know, I know you've heard countless lectures about the welcoming of Ramadan before, and you're, I'm sure you're going to hear many things that you've heard before, but I also think, inshallah, maybe you might hear some things that you haven't heard before. And but I don't want to make this into the form of a lecture, but rather much more of a conversation so that you can take some of these things back with you. The more I make you repeat things, the more you tend to remember, okay? So we're going to start with something that's kind of unexpected. We're gonna start with Ibrahim alayhi salam. And today I'm going to try to show you how Ibrahim alayhi salam has a lot to do with Ramadan. A lot of people don't realize that. Ibrahim alayhi salam has two children that we're going to focus on. One of the children is Ismail and the other is, any guess, any guess? Ishaq. Ismail and Ishaq. Okay, now we're going to first work on Ishaq alayhi salam, who's also a prophet. By the way, Ismail is a prophet and Ishaq is a prophet. So we're focusing on Ishaq alayhi salam, who also has a child. And that child's name is Ya'qub. Ya'qub. So the grandfather is who? Ibrahim alayhi Then the son? Ishaq. And the grandson? Ya'qub. And Ya'qub has an uncle. Uh oh. Oh, good. Ismail, very good. Pay attention. <laughs> Where did that come from? Yes, Ismail uncle. Okay, very good. Now, Ya'qub alayhi salam has a nickname. Ya'qub has a nickname. His nickname is Israel. Okay, so we're going to start over again. The grandfather is who? Ibrahim, the, grand, the son, Ishaq, the grandson, Yaqub, whose other name is Israel. Israel has 12 children. Those are called the 12 sons of Israel. Okay, Israel has how many kids? 12. And each of those kids have big families. So each family becomes a tribe. So they're called the 12 tribes of Israel. Yes? That's how it's all connected. You got it? Who was on the other side? Ismail. Who has a child? We don't know. Who then has a child? We don't know. Who then has a child? Who knows? And lots of generations go by, there are no prophets. Nothing's going on on this side. There's a lot going on on the other side. What's going on on the other side? Help me out again. We start with Ibrahim, then we go to Ishaq, then we go to Yaqub, then we go to the children of Yaqub or the children of Israel. One of them is Yusuf. Yes? And Yusuf is also a prophet, yes or no? So now we've got four in a row. The score is really high on this side. Four prophets in a row. And then the Prophet ﷺ made the score even higher. He told us about the children of Israel. Every time a prophet would die, another would take his place. There was not a single generation of the entire history of the children of Israel, they did not have a prophet. A prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. I mean, they got a lot of prophets. 
What's happening on the other side in the meantime? Nothing. They're on vacation for a long time. Okay, there's a big vacation on this side. Now, because they got so many prophets, and this side got how many prophets? Zero. After Ismail Aisam, there's no score. This team keeps scoring, this team gets no score for a long time. So they get used to scoring. And they assume that every time they kick the ball, it's going to be a goal. Whoa, some, some, I, that was not me. Who is me? Hold on, let me, I'll be right back. Why you got to do that, bro? No, no, they can't hear in the back. They should have come earlier. <laughs> anyway, so where, what was I saying? Something about Islam, I forgot. What was I saying? Remind me. Oh, the score. There you go, the score. So the score is really high on this side. And they get used to the fact that every time a prophet will come, he will come from which side? From the Israel side. Because that's what always happens. You know, when you get something a lot, you stop appreciating it. When you have something a lot, you don't appreciate it anymore. If you eat meat every day, eh. If you eat meat only on Eid, oh my God. <laughs> I, I'll tell you something about myself. I'm on a diet. I haven't had chocolate in 30 days. When I look at chocolate, I don't look at it, it looks at me. <laughs> okay? <laughs> if you eat chocolate every day, then you have no appreciation for chocolate, let me tell you. Let me tell you. A Kit Kat is just a Kit Kat to you. It is a piece of Jannah to me right now. I'm still not going to eat it, but I'm telling you, something happens. You start appreciating things more when you don't have them, yes? Now the, this side keeps getting profits, so guess what happens? They stop appreciating prophets. They take it for granted. It's no big deal. So what if we got a prophet? And first thing happens, you don't take care of it. The next thing that happens is you ignore them. And then things get really bad. Sometimes they even killed them. How are you people believing in prophets? And it gets so bad that sometimes you even kill them. Kill them. And, on, and even worse than killing them, there's something even worse than killing them. You know what, what's worse than killing prophets? Is making lies about prophets. They made lies about prophets. They actually, I studied a little bit of the Old Testament, and I discussed it with a rabbi friend of mine. Um, it's interesting how we, the rabbi and I became friends. That's for another time. I know some of you are like, Astaghfirullah al -Azim, I'm leaving right now. I need to make wudu because of what I just heard. But anyway, relax, hold on a second. So this rabbi of mine tells me stories of the prophets from their book or from their, edi their edited version of the book. And man, if you only knew about the prophets from their book, you would not want to follow prophets. You would not want to follow prophets. They are not good people in the Bible. They are incredible human beings in the Quran, but they are not good people in the Bible. Read about Nuh alayhi salam in the Bible, you will not want to follow Nuh alayhi salam. <laughs> you know, Read about the prophets of Banu Israel, you will not want to follow them. You will, they're completely different people. When we say Nuh and they say Noah, we think they're talking about the same person. We're not. They have a completely different version of these people. That is so way different than our own. I'll just give you one example of that. I'll start with the grandfather. The, the example of the grandfather, I don't remember who that was. You remember, remind me? Oh yeah, Ibrahim alayhi salam. So I asked the rabbi about Ibrahim. I asked the rabbi, what did you learn from Abraham? What is the biggest lesson Jewish people learn from Abraham? You know what he told me? I, get, I love this one. He told me we learn that we can question God and we can negotiate with Him. And I said, you mean like Abraham, Abraham, right? He goes, yeah, of course. Now compare that to Islam. Before we go, say astaghfirullah, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Okay, before that, listen. What we learn about Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam, is qala lahu rabbuhu aslim, qala aslam tuli rabbil alameen. Whenever his master said, submit, I, I give up. What did they learn? That he negotiated with Allah. And from him we learn that if Allah tells us, if God tells us to do something, we can say, let's talk about this. Let's, literally, this is not, I'm not making this up. I heard this myself directly. I'm first-hand witness. I don't like to talk about another group of people and their beliefs until they tell me their beliefs themselves. I don't want to read about their beliefs from Muslims. We're, we're Muslim, we like Islam better. 
Just like we don't want them to read about Islam from Christians or from Jews. So if I want to learn about the Christians, who should I go ask? The Christians. And not just any Christian, I should ask a Christian scholar. If I learn, want to learn about Judaism, I shouldn't learn about it from Ibn Kathir rahimahullah. I should learn about Judaism from the Jewish scholar. Let's go talk to him. I don't mind. I can hang out. I can have a kosher pizza with him. Not right now, I'm on a diet, but you know, eventually. <laughs> but now, coming back to the point. The story begins with Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam was responsible for putting a building together. Somewhere. Any, any... It's a little closer to your neighborhood. Anybody familiar? <laughs> Ibrahim alayhi salam is responsible for building this building with his older son. Along with his older son, whose name is? Ismail. Ismail. And they're building this building together. And when they, as they're finishing this building, they both make a, a dua to Allah together. They make a dua to Allah together. And the dua they make, there's two parts of it, I'll share both of them with you. He said, رَبَّنَا وَجْعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكْ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكْ Make both of us Muslim before you. So who's both of us? When this prayer is happening, who's both of us? You tell me. Ibrahim and? Ismail, okay. The other side. They said, Ya Allah, make sure we're both Muslim. And from our future generations, there should be at least one Muslim nation. Give us at least how many? Ummatan, not umaman, ummatan, muslimatan, lak. They asked for how many Muslim nations? One, okay. Later on, these two again made another dua in the same process. They're building the Kaaba, they're putting the, raising the foundations of it, and they make another dua. And their dua is, Rabbana wab'ath fihim rasulan minhum yatlu alayhim ayatik. Our master raise among that Muslim nation, or these among these children of ours, future generations, one messenger, Rasulan, not Rasulan, Rasulan minhum, a messenger among them. How many messengers did they ask for? One. How many messengers came on the other side? Every generation. You remember that? But for the older son, what did Ibrahim alayhi salam ask for? One messenger. This messenger should be so incredible that even if they get all their messengers in every generation, this one scores more and is heavier, and is more magnificent than all of them put together. All of them put together. Who do you think that is? That's the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there's no, no messenger, no messenger, no messenger, no messenger, no messenger, no messenger. By the way, there were no messengers for so long that the masjid that they built, they built a masjid, didn't they? The masjid that they built became a temple for idols. That's a really long time. I don't imagine any time soon this masjid will be a temple. You can't imagine. It would have to be a long time and all the Muslims have died and their children have died and nobody was able to teach the deen anymore and so much corruption happened that there were idols inside the masjid. Because you have to understand the Kaaba was always a masjid. That's always been the house of Allah. It's al-masjid, al-haram. So the fact that there are idols in there, you can expect idols inside a Hindu temple. You can expect an idol inside a Buddhist temple. But to expect an idol or numbers of idols inside where? A masjid, that's shocking. That's shocking. That tells you how long things had gone on and that one messenger they asked for hasn't come. He hasn't come. Now, who was used to getting messenger after messenger after messenger? Yeah, they, were, they got really used to it. Until Allah sent them their last one. The last one Allah sent them, his name is Isa. Alayhi salam. Okay, the last one for them was who? Isa. Okay, let's go back. I need to see if you remember, because that's a lot of names now. Who's the grandfather? Okay, then there's, on this side, on the Bani Israel side, who's his son? Ishaq. Ishaq's son is? Yaqub's son is? Twelve sons, one of them is who? Yusuf. Somebody said Isa. Mm, mm. <laughs> Wake up! <laughs> okay. Now Yusuf alayhi salam, and then after him generation and generation and generation of prophets, 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 prophets and things keep going and going and going and going and going. Eventually the last one for them, who? 
Isa alayhi salam. And if they were bad to prophets, they were the worst to Isa. They were the worst. Nobody. They were never worse to anybody else than Isa alayhi salam. Actually, they started insulting him even when he was a baby. At least let him grow up a little before you go after him. You know, they started it from day one. They went after him, and they went after his mother. They didn't even spare his mom. And they finally, not only did they insult him and make lies against him, even when he was a baby, eventually they even conspired to what? To kill him. But Allah didn't let them kill him. And Allah removed him from them. When He removed him from them, Allah decided something. Allah decided, no more prophets for you. It stopped. The last one was who? Isa. Then almost 600 years go by, no prophets for them. The well has run dry. They were used to getting it every generation, and then it stopped for almost six centuries. So now they are really appreciating, yeah, I wish we, wish we had a messenger again. Oh, Because the books told us there's one more coming, and he's going to be from the family of Ibrahim, and he's going to be from the son of Ibrahim. He's coming, we're waiting for him. And they, were co- and they were waiting for him, and waiting for him, and waiting for him. And he wasn't coming. And you know what? That time, some of them were living in the Arab world. Some of them were living in Arabia. And sometimes they used to fight with the children of Ismail. <laughs> the people of Quraysh. They used to have fights. And they used to lose all the time. And when they lost, they used to say, you got us this time. But the final messenger is coming, you watch. When he comes, we're gonna get you. <laughs> He's coming, the score is gonna be all oh, ho ho. And so he came. But the problem was, according to them, he came to the wrong address. <laughs> he was supposed to come on this side, and he came on, which family? The children of Ismail. And they're like, oh, what? what? How does that work? We can't have that. So they went back in their books and they said, wait, Allah t- told us there's a prophet coming. Where's, 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 where's? <gasps> it was there. They had it. They kind of forgot to, because he didn't come for so long, they decided that they won't even talk about the fact that he will come from the older son's lineage. I, I'll stop the story for a second. I'll tell you something I learned recently. There's a, an amazing scholar of Islamic history, incredible scholar. A lot of people don't know him. He's an Indian alim. He died in the early 1900s. Uh, his name is Hamiduddin Farahi. Hamiduddin Farahi. I'll tell you something what make, about what makes him amazing. This man, this Indian scholar, he traveled to Syria, to Morocco, to, to, to Hijaz to study deen. He studied hadith, tafsir, Quran in the 1800s. He traveled back then. There were no flights back then, by the way. Right? And he studied religion for about 50 years of his life. He studied Islam. And then he decided that he wants to understand the Jewish religion. So for 10 years, he studied Hebrew. After being a, like a master of Arabic language. He's an Indian scholar. He only wrote in Arabic. He only wrote in Arabic. He's such a gangster. I love him. He's like my hero. He's like the Desi scholar that has the most epic Arabic. I love that man. You know, I read some of his books and I'm like, oh, that's good stuff. You know. So he, re- he decides to study Hebrew because of one ayah of the Quran. يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ They know him like they know their own children. Allah said they know him, they know the final prophet, they know, the, they know Muhammad Rasulullah Wasallam like they know who? Their own children. So he decides, if they know him that well, he must be in their book. But if I need to see their book, I don't trust them too much. I want to read it myself. So if I want to read it myself, what do I have to learn? So he spends 10 years learning Hebrew. And then he writes a book. He writes a book called, Al-Ra'yu sahih fi man huwa al-dhabih. The correct opinion about who was to be slaughtered. I need you to understand this background. It's a fun story. I thought you were talking about Ramadan today, Sad Narman. I think you're a little too tired. It's coming. And it's gonna come before Ramadan. Relax, okay? So <laughs> we'll get there. But I need you to understand this first. So he show, it's such an awesome book. It's broken up into three parts. Part one: how the Bible proves that the son that was supposed to be slaughtered, by the way, what am I talking about, the son that was supposed to be slaughtered? Who was supposed to slaughter a son? 
Ibrahim was supposed to slaughter a son. Why? Because he, why was he supposed to slaughter a son? Because he saw a dream. Now the Jews say that the son he was supposed to slaughter was Ishaq. And the Quran actually indicates very strongly that the son he was supposed to slaughter is who? Ismail. Now you could say, who cares? He didn't get slaughtered anyway, so what's the problem? <laughs> There's no problem. There is a problem. Let me tell you why. You know what they did? They said that the son to be slaughtered is Ishaq. That's because Ishaq is the special son. And that means that Ismail is the cursed son. And that means that Ismail and all of his children are cursed. And every religion they follow will be the religion of the devil. They wrote this. All of it based on what? That the son to be slaughtered was who? Ishaq. And they made the entire story up in the Torah. And they changed the language of it. And this scholar showed that this, this is how they changed it. He took his son to a valley where there was little, just one fountain of water. A valley with just one fountain of water. Uh, and then they say, the name of the valley was Sakka. Oh, that's an interesting misspelling of what? Makkah. And he took him between the valley of Shifa and Mura. Shifa and Mura. Safa and? I wish they had Microsoft Word back then. Maybe we wouldn't have this problem. <laughs> Bill Gates could have solved this problem a long time ago. <laughs> For God's sake. And they, then the funny thing, they say he took him close to the temple of Solomon. Here's a problem. Solomon came many generations later, dude. <laughs> you messed up your own story. You know, geographically it doesn't even work. So the first part of his book, he showed how the Torah is actually doing a really, their changed version is doing a really bad job of hiding Makkah. Then the book says, they say, the Bible says, slaughter your only son. Slaughter your only son. Now we mentioned two sons. Who are the two sons? Ismail and Ishaq. Quran tells us, Torah also tells us, the older son is Ismail, 14 years older. Ismail is older. Ishaq is what? If you have a younger son, you will never say your only son. You can only say your only son if you only have one son, and you can only say that for which son? For Ismail. Then they said, no, 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 no. But you know, Ismail was born from a slave girl. So Ibrahim wasn't really married to her. So he doesn't count as a legitimate child. They were willing to call a prophet an illegitimate child just so they can hold on to the idea that Ishaq is the one to be slaughtered. They were willing to change Makkah to what? Sakra. They were willing to change Marwa to Mura. <laughs> Just so they can hold on to that idea. Why? Because we, we, don't, we can't even stand one prophet on that side. We want all of them on this side. And for lots of centuries, nobody came on that side, so there's no problem. We're happy. But all of a sudden, the prophet comes on this side. And they say, Wait, we tried to cover this up. We tried to cover this up. How come this came out? And the Qur'an, you know, clearly talks about how they hid it. They had it, but they hid it on purpose. And they wouldn't tell their, their people. And by the way, there were a lot of people of the Jewish community at the time in Medina who would hear the Prophet ﷺ speak, and they say, wait, we heard a khutbah about this. He's the one. Then they'd go back to their shaykh. Hey. And he says, I know, but shh. <laughs> And the Qur'an talks about those secret meetings too. Oh my God! They would go in secret meetings and say, He's the, he's the one who gave a khutbah about it last week on Saturday. Because they don't have Friday khutbah, right? <laughs> and he'd say, yeah, of course, but come on, man. We want to switch sides now? You can't do that. Now let me go back and tell you why this is about Ramadan. The Prophet ﷺ was given fasting. Not in Ramadan, before Ramadan. The Prophet was given fasting when? Before Ramadan. 
and he used to fast on the same days as the Jews. He used to fast when? Same days as the Jews. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu kutiba alaykum as-siyam kama kutiba ala ladhina min qablikum. Fasting was given to you, was mandated upon you, just like it was for the people who came before you. Who were the people that came before us? Banu Israel. And they had fasting, and the Prophet ﷺ used to fast on exactly the same days. The Prophet ﷺ was given prayer, the, the daily prayers. But he didn't pray towards the Kaaba. Where did he pray? He used to pray towards Jerusalem. So many of the rituals of Islam that we follow today, before we followed them our way, we used to follow them whose way? Their way, the other side. We have no problem with that, because those are also prophets. Because their, fa their grandfather is also who? Ibrahim. And this is still the religion of Ibrahim. So we have no problem. Until the Qur'an will tell us to do something else, we will do what the other prophets did. There's no problem on this side. So we used to pray in the same direction as them, and we used to fast on the same days as them. And this was our way, uh, this was Allah's way of telling them, this is not something different, come on! What's wrong with you? Just because it's on the other side, he's still your cousin! He's still from the same father, who's the father? Or the grandfather? Ibrahim, same family, what's your problem? If you love your family so much, you should love your grandfather. That's where it all started anyway. And why do you have, and then, then what does Allah do? This is Surah Al-Baqarah. The ayat of fasting are where? Surah Al-Baqarah. The first part of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah talked about the other family. Bani Israel, yes? And He said, you messed up so many times. So many times. Over and over again, you kept messing up. You even killed prophets. Why do you think I should send you another prophet so you can kill him again? Basically, you don't deserve it. And you say that we are a special family. And Allah tells them, you are not a special family. The only reason you're a special family is because you're grandchildren of who? Ibrahim. So in Surah Al-Baqarah, when Allah finishes talking about the Jews, about the children of Israel, He starts telling us about Ibrahim. Why? Because He's reminding them, the only thing that makes you special is who? Ibrahim a.s. And if you think, if you love Ibrahim a.s., you should love his children. And his older son was who? Ismail. So he introduces Bani Israel to Ismail. He introduces them to Ismail. Okay. What dua did they make? Make us Muslim. At least one nation among us should be what? Muslim. And send us how many messengers? One messenger. Okay. Now let me tell you how, how amazing this is. To me, this is the most mind blowing thing about Ramadan. I love this about Ramadan. You know the name of Islam. What, the, Islam has many names. Dinul Haq, the religion of truth. One of its names is Millata Abikum Ibrahim, the religion of your father Ibrahim. Please remember that. What is a, when a name of Islam is what? The religion of your father Ibrahim. How many pillars in Islam? That's a genius question. I didn't put my hand out. <laughs> I didn't have that much confidence. The 73. No, no, no. <laughs> five. Four out of five are directly related to Ibrahim. Five pillars in Islam, and at least four of them are directly related to who? Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam was born in a family and in a town everybody worshipped idols and he's the only one who stands up and says La ilaha illallah. He's the only one who believes in one God. And then he builds the house that will make sure that will people until the day of judgment will say La ilaha illallah. In other words, the shahada is a legacy of who? Ibrahim alayhi salam. Everybody understand the shahada? What's next? Salah. Salah. How salah related to Ibrahim alayhi salam? Rabbi j'alni muqima as salah. His dua was, Ya Allah, make me someone who establishes salah. And out of my children. When he was building the Kaaba, he made that dua. By the way, there's something else. Ibrahim, my, my teacher, Dr. Akram Nadwi, what an amazing guy. Man, I was hanging out with him in England and I asked him, Dr. Akram, what is your favorite ayah in the Quran? What is your favorite ayah in the Qur'an? And he said the strangest answer. He said, لا أحب الآفلين I said, this is your favorite ayah? لا أحب الآفلين means I don't like those that settle. Ibrahim alayhi salam saw the sun and it settled. He saw the moon and it settled. He saw the stars and they disappeared in the daytime. And he said, لا أحب 
Afili. I don't love those, the things that settle, the things that disappear. None of these things are constant. He said, that's my favorite ayah. I said, why is that your favorite ayah? And he says to me, because this is the ayah that teaches us the real meaning of salah. I said, what? You know, we believe in the unseen, yes? Stay with me, this is gonna be fun. We believe in the unseen. But when we see the world that is seen around us, what is the biggest creation you see? There's no bigger creation than that creation that your eyes can see. What is that? The sun. The sun is the most magnificent creation of Allah for our eyes. There's nothing greater than that. And you guys have a lot of sun. <laughs> MashaAllah. <laughs> you know, that's one thing you don't forget here. <laughs> and of course, the sun and in the night, what's the most magnificent creation? The moon. And beyond the moon, what is the beauty of the stars? What if, what, if, what if not the beauty of the stars? Yes? You know, people used to worship the sun. People used to worship the moon. People used to worship the stars. I'll tell you something so cool. It's totally not related to this lecture. It's a complete tangent, but I have to tell you because it's that cool. In about, about five years ago, they did an excavation of the city of Ur, U-R. The city is spelled U-R, ancient Babylonia, some parts of Iraq, outskirts of Iraq near Turkey somewhere. And they found a city buried about 50 feet under the ground, an ancient city. And their Bible scholars actually now agree, Jewish study scholars agree, that was the village of Abraham, Babylonia. And they found in that village thousands of idols. Thousands, small, big, action figure size, you know, regular size, two liter bottle size, and then like, you know, mega size, and then you have the super mega size, etc. All size of idols. Every household different idols. The Bible says they worshipped many idols. The Bible says what? They worshipped many idols. The Bible never says he saw the sun, he saw the moon, he saw the star. He doesn't, he doesn't, the Bible doesn't say that. By the way, kawkab, Kaukab in Arabic is actually Jupiter. So the Quran mentions that the Ibrahim السلام, pointed to the sun, he pointed to the moon, and he pointed to Jupiter. Okay? Now, when they dug these idols, how many idols did they find? What did I say? Thousands. Thousands. But they only found three idols that were bigger than everybody else. There were three guys, three giant men, idols. One guy, his head was shaped like Starbucks, like the sun. One guy, his head was a crescent moon, and one guy was a planet with rings around it, which is what? Jupiter. So they now think that the three main gods of that society were the sun god, and the moon god, and Jupiter. The Bible never said anything about this. What did? Quran did. The Quran. Ibrahim السلام, instead of attacking all the idols, when he demonstrated the sun, the moon, and, the, and Jupiter, he, he went after the biggest ones. SubhanAllah. Anyway, that was the cool thing I wanted to share with you on the side. Coming back to the, the, the point. Ibrahim السلام, builds this Kaaba. And the, you know, the idols are all gone. The idols are now, you know, they have been destroyed. Rasulullah how is he related? How is, how is Salah related? Because every time the sun goes down, it shows you that the sun is not all-powerful, yes? And the sun goes down and it reminds you that it's not permanent. The only one that is permanent is who? Allah. The moon goes down, it's not there forever. And it reminds you that even the greatest creation is not forever. The only one forever is Allah. Every time the sun moves its position, it's time for another salah, isn't it? Every time? We remind ourselves, La uhibbul afilin. We remind ourselves of the journey of Ibrahim alayhi <laughs> salam. Our daily prayers revolve around the weakness of the sun. Yes or no? And when the sun is at its weakest, when the sun is at its weakest, it's at Maghrib. It's about to die. And that's when our prayers start getting even louder. Maghrib is a loud prayer or a quiet prayer? And then when the sun is completely down, our prayers get longer and louder. Aisha. And the sun's weakness is still, it's nowhere to be found when? At Fajr, and we're still the loudest when it's the weakest, subhanAllah. 
It's actually a legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Muqim al-Salati. So, shahada goes back to Ibrahim and prayer goes back to Ibrahim. But there are a couple more pillars. Well, we'll deal with fasting last because that's our program. Hajj. Hajj doesn't go back to Ibrahim, does it? Alayhi salam? Oh, wait a second. How is Hajj related to Ibrahim alayhi salam? Uh, the Kaaba, I mean... So the Kaaba, and there is kind of وَاتَّخِذُوا مِن مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى There's Maqam Ibrahim. Then there's Safa and Marwa. That has nothing to do with Ibrahim, does it? Oh wait, it does. Oh yeah, it's all in the family. Jamarat has to do with Ibrahim a.s. Okay, at least the slaughter of the animal has nothing to do with Ibrahim a.s. Oh wait. <laughs> Everything you do at Hajj goes back to who? Ibrahim a.s. Shahada goes back to Ibrahim. Salah goes back to Ibrahim a.s. Hajj goes back to Ibrahim a.s. What's left? No, before zakah. I saw four out of five. I said four out of five. Five, inshallah, another day. That's a long lecture. Four. What's four? Ramadan. Fasting in the month of Ramadan. What was the dua that Ibrahim alayhi salam made for how many prophets? Who was with him when he made that dua? And the dua was, send a messenger among them who will recite your ayat to them. Yatlu alayhim ayatik. Yes? Okay. And the dua was fulfilled when the Prophet blank came. When the Prophet... Muhammad came, reciting what? Quran. Quran came in which month? Ramadan. And Allah decided that that month is so important because that is the month in which the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam was answered. So the entire month should be celebrated with fasting. We are actually celebrating the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam being fulfilled. That's what you call the religion of Abraham. Millata abikum Ibrahim. Do you understand how fasting is related to Ibrahim alayhi salam? Because the Qur'an coming, which means the Prophet coming and reciting the Qur'an, happened because of the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. It's incredible. Now let's go back. How does Allah talk about Ramadan? Surah Al-Baqarah, He talked about the Jews. Then He told us, He told the Jews, You forgot about your father Ibrahim. Then he starts talking to the Muslims and says a couple of things. First thing he says is, now you no longer pray towards Jerusalem, you will pray towards the house that your father built. Which is which house? Makkah. Kaaba. You know, we now became a new nation. The Muslims used to say that we are now the same nation as Banu Israel, we're one family. You know, it's not a big difference, but Allah says, no, those people have abandoned Ibrahim. They abandoned Ibrahim alayhi salam. They are no longer family. Now you have to go back to the house of Ibrahim. So he turns the Muslims towards the Kaaba. Now, we are a new what? Nation. When you have a new nation, you need a new capital. Yes or no? What is the capital of this Ummah? The Kaaba. When you have a new nation, you need a new capital. Now, when you have a new nation, you also need a new Independence Day. Don't you? Every nation has an Independence Day. And Independence Day is the day in which they celebrate their constitution. Because when they're independent, they can celebrate their own constitution. What, what is our constitution? The Book of Allah, the Qur'an. The Qur'an was given to us, Inna anzalnahu fi... I don't remember the surah, it's so hard. Inna anzalnahu fi... Laylatul Qadr. We sent it down in the night of... Where, when is Laylatul Qadr? I think it's the... Uh, when is it? Which, which month of the year? I think February. It's Ramadan, isn't it? In other words, instead of having a, an Independence Day, this is so awesome that Allah made it an Independence what? Month. A new nation should have a capital, Kaaba. A new nation should have an Independence Day, we got a month, Ramadan. A new nation should have its own constitution, which is what? Quran. We're a new nation. That's why he says, وَكَذَٰلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا Ah, that's how we made you a a middle nation, a balanced nation. We have now become a new ummah altogether, celebrated by the fact that Ramadan has come. The fact that Ramadan is celebrated every year is the fact that you're almost taking your shahada over again. You're becoming Muslim all over again. You're refreshing your relationship with your father Ibrahim alayhi salam, me with my father Ibrahim alayhi salam. It all goes back to him.
Ali Sab. It's and I haven't. I, this was my introduction. Sorry. I'll do the lecture now. <laughs> One guy's like, ah, <laughs> that's okay. You were gonna sleep anyway, I and mean, you had a long day. It's okay. I don't hold anything against you. You know, sisters, don't take notes. You know, brothers, just relax, just sleep. It's okay. I don't even hold it against you anymore. It's fine. It's totally okay. Just if I do catch one of you sleeping, I'll ask the cameraman to point at you and zoom in so that um, your wife will enjoy that. <laughs> Inshallah. But anyway, so now I begin. The ayat of fasting. Fasting was given to you just like it was given to the people before you so that you may have taqwa. La'allakum tattaqoon. So my first subject is what is the purpose of fasting according to the Quran? Taqwa. This is, this is not a. This is not a it's not going to be a very Islamic lecture. I'm not going to try to sound all sheikh-like, because I'm not a sheikh, so it's easy for me to not sound like a sheikh. I'm going to try to put this to you in easy psychological terms. Have, have you heard before that you should have taqwa? Yeah, especially you, right? <laughs> you should have taqwa. Ittaqillah. Have taqwa of Allah. I've heard it many times. You know the first question that pops in my head? How? Fine, you keep telling me to have taqwa, 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 taqwa. How do I get it? Where do you, is it outside the masjid? Is there, are they selling it outside somewhere? Is there some special biryani you have to eat to get it? What do you, how do you get taqwa? You keep telling people to get taqwa, you don't tell them how. Yes? Allah did not just get us, tell us to do something or be, some, be a muttaqi, but didn't give us a way to do it. Allah says, I will get you to taqwa if you do what? Fast. Fasting will get you to taqwa. So let's understand, how is fasting going to give me taqwa? Let's first define taqwa. What is taqwa? Fear of Allah, cautiousness about Allah, being careful about Allah, being aware of Allah, protecting yourself from doing the wrong thing. Here's my question, where does taqwa live? Where does taqwa live? The Prophet ﷺ answers this question saying, at taqwa Hahuna, hahuna, hahuna. Where does taqwa live? In the. That's why Allah says, "Fa inna dalika min taqwa al This is the the taqwa of the heart. So taqwa lives inside your heart. Now let's go back to fasting. Fasting is coming. Ramadan is coming. It's going to be a pretty hot day in Bahrain. About twelve o'clock, your throat is going to start feeling what? Thirst. Yes. Your thirst, your throat will send a complaint to your brain and to your heart. Hey man, I'm thirsty down here. <laughs> yes or no? About three o'clock, what's gonna happen? Stomach. Your stomach is gonna send a signal both ways to your heart and your brain. Come on man, what are you doing here? You're killing me. I'm dying here. They take care of business up there. What's going on? Where's the customer service in this restaurant? Like, you know, there's... There's going to be a war inside of you. There's going to be a war inside of you. Your body is going to fight with you. Yes or no? It's going to tell you, feed me. It's going to tell you, give me drink. Yes or no? And of course, there's the third one. There are children here. You guys know it's PG-13. Temptation. Temptation will come to you. And all of these requests are coming to you and they're hitting you and they're hitting you and they're hitting you But there's only one department in this entire government One department, the heart, that says to the throat, shut up, not until Maghrib It says to the stomach, you be quiet, not until Maghrib Yes or no? So this one thing, which is what? Your heart says, Allah said no, so be quiet but then the stomach goes You be quiet <laughs> It's not gonna stop your, heart, your stomach is not gonna say Okay fine, I'll be happy No, your stomach is gonna keep being hungry Your throat is gonna keep getting drier and drier It's gonna complain even more It's gonna complain even more Some of you, I love what you guys do You go to the iftar table Before your mother even puts the food down And just lie on it like this <laughs> You know And then she puts the french fries there And you're like just touching it Just touching it <laughs> you make a mountain of ketchup on your plate, looking at it from every angle, like... <laughs> Isn't Maghrib yet? And some people go by the second, they have digital clocks. Is it 33 today or 34? 33 or 34? <laughs> Why is it only 31? <laughs> Time slows down at the end, doesn't it? <laughs> but in any case, 
You know, all this time, this entire day, who won the battle the whole day? The heart. Where does taqwa live? Allah trains you for 30 days to let your heart win, doesn't He? For 30 days, your heart wins. Your throat loses, your stomach loses, your temptations lose. And your heart wins. 30 days in a row. When you do any exercise 30 days in a row, then you know what? You can turn it into a lifelong habit. There are psychology studies on this stuff. You can make lifelong habits if you can commit to them for how long? 30 days in a row. Allah gave us this training so we can develop taqwa. It's awesome. As a matter of fact, you're holding yourself back from drinking, which is halal. From eating, which is halal. From your spouse, which is halal. So that when this month is over, he's, gonna, he's not gonna ask you for more. Usually when you do training, then you're gonna ask to, be do, to do even more. Yes? But when you finish this training, Allah will ask you for more or for less? He's gonna ask you for less. So the day after Eid, when you're sitting at your home, and the chocolate is looking at you, and you eat it, you'll forget that it's Ramadan. And for, forget that it's not Ramadan, and you'll eat it and go, oh. <laughs> By mistake. <laughs> oh wait, it's over, yeah. Does it ever happen to you that you eat after Ramadan and still feel kind of guilty? Yeah? That's pretty good training. Now you're even thinking about the halal. And if you're even so cautious about the halal, then you must be super cautious about the what? That's the training of Ramadan. That's not, not, actually no, that's not the training of Ramadan, that's the training of fasting. Ramadan has its own purpose, fasting has its own purpose. This is the purpose of fasting. If you find yourself losing control, if you find yourself really tempted, if you find yourself going towards haram very easily, one of the easiest things you can do is consciously fast. Consciously, not subconsciously. Some people fast and say, well, might as well lose weight at the same time. No, no, no. If you consciously fast, it will actually develop taqwa. It will actually develop taqwa. It's a divine remedy from Allah. Now, the next ayah is about Ramadan. And I'm not, actually no. أَيَّامَ مَعْدُودَاتِ فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ I'm going to be brief on this part. I'll just tell you easily two things. Before Ramadan, did we still fast? Yes or no? Yes. The same days as the, as the Jews, as the children of Israel, yes? We fasted on the same days. And the rules were easier. The rules used to be easier. The rules were, you don't have 30 days, you have few days. Ayyaman, ma'dudat. They're few days. They're not, they're not a lot of days. Handful of days. Okay? So first of all, they're not 30 days in a row. They're just a few. Second of all, if you miss one, you could make it up. Or, if you were capable of fasting, you weren't sick. You didn't miss one because you were sick. You didn't miss one because you were traveling. You missed one because you were not in the mood. Maybe that happened. You could either make it up, or you could feed some poor person. Fidiyatun ta'amu miskin. You had two options. Once again, if you miss a fast, what two options did you have? Remind me. You either make it up. Wake up, wake up. You either make it up or what? Feed someone. Option A or option? B. Is it 30 days in a row? No, it's a few days. And you have two ways to make it up, yes? So it's pretty easy. It's pretty easy. And then at the end of it, Allah says, وَمَن تَطَوَّعَ خَيْرًا فَهُوَ خَيْرُ اللَّهِ وَأَن تَصُومُوا خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ And if you fast is better for you, I'm not making it mandatory, but if, it, if you did fast, it would be better for you. So everything's very relaxed. It's very relaxed. Now we come to the ayah of Ramadan. I want you to remember that the rules were relaxed. Now we come to the ayah of Ramadan. شَهْرُ Ramadan. The month of Ramadan. It already began with the words, month of Ramadan. Uh-oh, it's not gonna be a few days, it's gonna be an entire month. Already sounds harder. Doesn't it? It sounds harder. Now if he's gonna say, the month of Ramadan is the one in which you will fast 30 consecutive days. الَّذِي تَصُومُونَ فِيهِ سَلَثِينَ يَوْمًا متتاليًا مُتَتَابِعًا No, no, no. He doesn't say that. He says, the month of Ramadan is the one in which the Qur'an was sent down. شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ Al-Qur'an. The first thing Allah wants you to think about when you think of Ramadan is not pakore, it's not samose, it's not the ketchup, it's not the fries, it's not the sleeping during the taraweeh. Allahu Akbar. 
You're the only guy standing up. Everybody else is in Ruku, you're like... <laughs> then there are people who do extra long sajda, not because they're in khushur. Because they're like, come on. <laughs> That's not what you think about when you think about Ramadan. Quran is telling you, when you think about Ramadan, you will have to think about what first and foremost? The fact that the Quran, the greatest gift of Allah, the fulfillment of the dua of Ibrahim السلام, was given to you in this month. The, the promise was fulfilled in this month. Let's just stop here and think about that for a second. If I just talked about this the rest of the night until Fajr, I wouldn't stop. But I'll give you at least a couple of things to think about. Ibrahim السلام, made this dua, where? Where? How many people with him? One. Was there a camera? Microphones? I have eight microphones on right now. I feel like a Terminator. Right now, like, <laughs> come with me if you want to live. <laughs> this is, I'm so equipped right now. But anyway, you know, if Ibrahim Aysam, how many, how many media pe people were there? How many microphones? Any writers? Any document, documentation? Any? Nothing? Nobody there? How many people? Two. In a, in a very populated city? <laughs> in the middle of a desert burning rock in a place that no human being in their right mind would ever want to go if it, if, if it was not for the Kaaba you are not going to take a vacation in Mecca I guarantee you there's only one cubic building there that makes it a reason to go otherwise there is no reason to go there I mean definitely not the cab drivers there's no reason to go there there's no reason to be there it's not, it's not for the weather definitely now sometimes I wonder, why didn't Allah put the Kaaba in California? It would have been so much nicer. You could go there, enjoy the beach, then do tawaf, and then, you know, have a break. You know, it's nice weather, you know. No, he put, his, he put this in the one place, that if it wasn't for that building, you would never go there. Why? Because Allah wants ikhlas. If it was in a beautiful place, you would go there for two reasons. Yeah? If it was in a fun a place with a lot of nice weather, you would go there for two reasons. When you go to Mecca, you only go for what? One reason and one reason and one reason only. Man. It's, it's, it's hikmah of Allah that He chose that place. Khair, Ibrahim is by himself. He makes that prayer. Who remembers that prayer? His son. Were they able to pass down that prayer to their children? No. Because a few generations later, what did those children become? idol worshippers. So that dua, nobody even remembers it. And maybe, maybe the other side remembers it. Who's the other side? Bani Israel, maybe they remember it. No, they don't want to remember it. Because they only like to remember which part of the family? Their side of the family, they don't like the cousin too much. Yes? So now, that dua has disappeared. No human being on the earth knows that dua. Those were just some words said by a man and his son in the middle of an unknown place in a valley and those words die. Just like when you say things, there are sound waves and they disappear. But then those sound waves traveled across the seven skies and they, they were heard on the Arsh of Allah. And those words were then re echoed back in the coming of the Qur'an. And this Qur'an came in that same desert, didn't it? It came in that same place where the dua was made, didn't it? So the place where the dua was made and the place where the dua was answered is the same place, yes or no? Now, when this, when this Qur'an came, Mecca, was that like a really advanced society? No, the Romans were an advanced society. The Persians were an advanced society. The Chinese were an advanced society. The Indians had an ancient civilization. Every other nation of the world had universities, had learning institutions, had infrastructure, had empire, had civilization, had libraries. The only nation I can think of that is geographically connected to all of that but has no intellectual history to speak of other than their poetry is who? The Arabs of that land. All they have is a legacy of shirk now. They didn't even remember the legacy of their father Ibrahim. They don't. And Allah gave this book in that place. In that place. Imagine today somebody says, I want to get a higher education. I should go to the Aborigines in Australia. Or I should go to some village in Pakistan where they don't even have brick housing. 
That's where I should get a higher education. Who would think of that? The highest education ever given to humanity was given there, to those people. You know how low the world thought of that region? The Romans, you know about, if you study Roman history, Romans love to advance their territory. The one place they were not interested in is what? Arabia. Why, we, why should we send our soldiers to get barbecued in the middle of the sand? There's no oil yet. There's no reason to go. The Persians left them alone. The Abyssinians left them alone. Everybody left them alone. Because it wasn't worth it. And then in this land, Allah gives this book. Even if you give a book here, who's going to read it? These people? These people that herd animals? These Bedouins? That's it? Where's it going to go? And look at the word of Allah. Look at the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He said that this house that he's building, people should have a love for this house in all corners of the world. وَإِذْ جَعَلْنَا الْبَيْتَ مَثَابَةً لِي النَّاسِ أَنَّا لَا لِلْعَرَبِ this book spread outside that little desert and it spread so far and wide that the vast majority of you sitting in the audience today are not ethnically connected to that desert or that family. The only thing that brought you to this masjid is that book. And you know what? The only thing that brought me and you here is the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. That's the power of dua. Allah says, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi Al-Qur'an. When you remember the Qur'an was given in that, in, that, uh, in that instant, in that month, you know what you're remembering? How much Allah can change the world with dua. The, the map of the world looks different because of the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. One fifth of the world's population says La ilaha illallah and growing because of the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So how dare a Muslim underestimate the power of dua. And they believe in Ramadan. He says, Hudal nas is guidance for people. Quran is guidance for people. Tell me, when was this ayah given? Is this, anybody know? Is this is Surah Al-Baqarah a Makki surah or a Madani surah? Huh? It's a Madani surah. Which means the Quran has been coming for a long time. Which means the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, have been students of the Quran for a long time. And they all know that Quran is guidance for humanity. They already know that. It's basic information, isn't it? So when you are in Medina, we should get more advanced knowledge. We should not get... Basic knowledge. And yet Allah says the most basic thing, the month of Ramadan is the one in which Qur'an was sent down as guidance for humanity. Why are we being told something so basic? Because in this month, it's like you start all over again. Like you don't even know this Qur'an. You recite it like you've never recited it before. You reflect on it like you've never reflected on it before. You memorize it like you've never, never memorized it before. You cry over it like you've never cried over it before. It is a refresher. It's not just another Ramadan. It's a new life for you. It's the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam answered for you personally, every year. Huda nas. By the way, Allah gave Torah to which nation? Torah. Bani Israel. وَجَعَلْنَاهُ هُدَى لِي Bani Israel. Allah gave them the book, He made it a guidance for Bani Israel. And they thought guidance, the special guidance of Allah is for their nation and their nation only. But when Allah gave that one messenger, because Ismail's family did not get lots of messengers, they only get one messenger. How is one messenger going to be heavier than all of those messengers combined? Because this one messenger will have a message that is not just for his people. This is a message for who? All of humanity, all together. So Allah says, Hudal lin nas. By the way, when the month of Ramadan is being mentioned, and then Allah says, Hudal lin nas, you know what that also means. Some say, some Nahwiyun say, Hudal lin nas halun li shahr. A shahr hudal lin nas. Whoa. You know what that means? That means you can give the, all human beings on this earth, Allah will make their hearts softer in Ramadan. Not even just Muslims. All human beings have a closer access to Allah in the month of what? Ramadan. So if you share the Qur'an with non-Muslims in this month, they are closer to guidance than will ever be in their life. 30 days of us trying to spread the word of Allah. To all of humanity. What a chance. What a chance. Because this, this, this house that Allah built, Allah didn't build this house for the Arabs. He didn't build this house for the Pakistanis. 
He didn't build it for the Bangladeshis and the Indians and just the Muslims. He says he built this house for who? أَوَّلَ بَيْتٍ وُضِعَ لِي النَّاسِ How are the people going to love the house that their father built if the guidance doesn't spread to them? This month is not just when you fulfill the dua of Ibrahim for yourself. This month is when you share the love Ibrahim السلام, had for all of humanity and you out of that love share the message of Allah. And you share it not because you hate the non-Muslims or you think they're going to hell or all of that. You share it because your father loved all people. السلام, Ibrahim السلام, loved all people. You know? That's why Allah didn't even call him part of one ummah. He was ummah by himself. <laughs> he's just ummah by himself. Because if you call him part of one ethnicity, then what happens? Then he's affiliated with them. But no, no, no. Kana ummatan. He's just an ummah by himself. You know? He's not part of a nation. He is a nation. <laughs> Subhanallah. So he says, Hudal lil nas. Then he says, Wabayyinatim min al huda wal furqan. I'm going to go just. It's going to go too long, so I'm going to just finish at this ayah, inshallah. There's lots of other things I could have talked to you about. But let's just, you know, instead of overkill and you guys start going to sleep, I'm going to finish at least this ayah with you. Maybe the next ayah, maybe. But I do want to pay attention to each phrase. Now, you guys feeling awake, by the way? No, you're not. Stand up. Stand up, hurry up. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Do it. Make some new friends, new enemies. Elbow someone. It's okay, it's not Ramadan yet. Okay, have a seat. Feels better, don't it? What you doing? Okay. What was I saying? Something about Islam or something? Oh yeah, the ayah. وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِّنَ الْهُدَىٰ And clear proofs from within guidance. This means many things. But I will only share with you one of those things. Or maybe two of those things. You know that Allah sent prophets before. You know that. And when Allah sent prophets, He sends two things. He sends two things. He sends a message, and He sends a miracle. I'll say that again. Allah sends prophets, and He sends them with how many things? Two things. What does He send them with? A message and a miracle. The message is Allah is one. Take responsibility for your actions. Be good and don't be bad. It's basic. The miracle is, let me prove to you I am a messenger of... Allah. Here's the evidence that there's no doubt that I am a messenger of Allah. So every messenger was given a message and a miracle. Well, the message of Musa السلام, is the same as all the other messengers. What is his miracle? The staff, the nine signs, the hand turning white, right? Those are his miracles. When it comes to the Prophet وسلم, he was also given two things, like every other Prophet. Every other Prophet was given two things, the message and the miracle. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, should also be given two things. What should those two things be? It should be a message and it should be a miracle. But the incredible thing is that this time the message and the miracle is the same thing. They were never the same thing before. Nobody sat and read the staff of Musa The message was what? Torah. The miracle was the staff. They're two, two separate things. They're two separate things. But with the Qur'an, what did Allah do? He made them into one. وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِّنَ الْهُدَىٰ Clearest evidences from within guidance. The, the, the clearest evidences did not used to be from within guidance. They used to be something else. The bayinat were something else. Like Musa alayhi salam says, أَوَلَوْ جِئْتُكَ بِشَيْءٍ مُّبِينٍ That's something else. And Huda is something else. But Allah put both of them together this time. Unlike any other. You know why? You know why? Because with every other prophet, the message lived on, but the miracle died. If you found the staff of Musa alayhi salam today, it's not going to turn into what? It's not going to turn into a snake. That's, that's over. You understand? But this was the last message, wasn't it? By the way, if you see a miracle, does it have a more powerful effect? Does a message by itself have more effect? Or if a message and a miracle are together, that has more effect? You can't even compare. There's no comparison. And the Qur'an is the final what? Message. But if the final message did not have the proper effect, it would die. So the final message also had to be the final what? Miracle. And since the message will keep going until the Day of Judgment, so will what? 
The miracle will keep going until the day of judgment. The Quran, we have to appreciate its message, we have to understand its message, and we have to constantly appreciate its what? Miracle. Our study of the Quran is two things. It's its message and its miracle. And both of them are important. And none of them will ever die. None of them. We will study the message of the Quran. Some kid is really angry back there. <laughs> He's really angry. I mean, that's seriously angry. No, that's not angry anymore. That was pretty intense though, aren't he? It's okay, I'm not mad. You could, you, babies could cry all they want. I don't, I, it doesn't bother me at all. I kind of consider it halal music. <laughs> like, when my kids cry, I sing along with them. Like, you know, ah, like, ah. <laughs> Then some kids get shocked when you cry. Then like, that's my job. You know? <laughs> and other kids say, oh yeah, I'll do it louder. <laughs> and it's like, it becomes a competition. <laughs> and I, I play the competition until my wife comes, stop it, what are you doing? It takes the fun away. Anyway, so what was I saying something about Islam? وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِنَ الْهُدَى And what's coming next? furqan. I'll say one more thing about بَيِّنَاتٍ مِنَ الْهُدَى That's important for everybody here to understand, inshaAllah. And that is that in your life and in my life, if you and I are sincere to the Book of Allah, if we genuinely want Allah's advice in our life, قَدْ جَاءَتْكُمْ مَوْعِظَةٌ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ If you genuinely want advice of Allah in your life, and you're having some trouble in your life, and you open up the Book of Allah, and you look for Allah's advice, what's gonna happen? You'll find it. And you will be in shock. How did I land upon this ayah? And this is exactly what I was looking for. This is guidance that came at the perfect time, especially custom made for who? Me. Custom for me. And you will experience this over and over and over again in your life. And this will be personal miracles to you. You cannot prove them to anybody else. This is Allah's gift to who? To you. I'll tell you mine. I can't prove it to you though. I cannot prove it to you, but I can tell you mine. If you believe me, you believe me. If you don't, inna lillahi wa inna My flight's in the morning, I don't care. Okay, so... So what happens with me? Since 1999, I've been giving khutbahs. Virtually every week, I give khutbah. And when I give khutbah, I have a terrible habit. I never prepare for a khutbah. Ever. I prepare for a khutbah by thinking about which ayat I'm going to talk about about 10 minutes before the khutbah. I study the Qur'an every day. I study tafsir every day. I study and think about the Book of Allah every day. That's why I don't prepare for a khutbah. Because to me, a khutbah is supposed to be a reflection on the Qur'an. So I choose from, there's a, there's a shelf in my head, and I choose an ayah. Ten minutes before. So here's what happens. Ten minutes, sometimes five minutes, sometimes while the adhan is happening, and I'm saying, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And I sit down, and the mu'adhan is giving the adhan, I'm thinking, which ayah? It's happened many times. Khair, I pick an ayah. Oh, yeah, that ayah from Surah Shu'ara, okay. And I open the Mus'haf. Every time for the last 15, 16 years, when I open the Mus'haf, it's on the ayah I was thinking about. Every time. I just randomly open it, grab a Mus'haf from the shelf, open it, it's the ayah I was thinking about. I don't flip pages to find the ayah. Here's one, that's one personal miracle for me. That's not for you, that's for me. Okay, y'all like keep it going. Okay, here's the second one. I have terrible allergies. I sneeze, I, you must have seen me lectures where I go. <laughs> constantly, constantly. I'm allergic to cologne, I'm allergic to oud. You know some, some brothers in the masjid, they put oud on and then they slap it on you anyway. Okay, brother, sunnah, sunnah. And this guy is like, and, and then my sneezing starts, and runny nose, and puffy eyes, and then of course, the best way to get allergies is sajda, at a masjid, right? Because the, the socks is amazing. You know, <laughs> the, you just take one breath, and it's, it's, you know, fungus among us. Anyway, so, my allergies are horrible, horrible. And I'm sniffling and stuffing my nose, and the adhan goes on 
while I'm sitting on the mimbar for a khutbah, and for the next 35 minutes, I don't sniffle. Salat is done, I start sneezing again. It comes back. Allah will give you miracles in your life. He will give you. That's part of bayyinatin min al khuda. That's personal for you. But he didn't stop there. He said, wal-furqan. He said he gave us something that is guidance for all people. On top of that, it is clear proof from within guidance. Allah will prove to you that this is His guidance. And He's guiding you, and He's guiding you, and He's guiding you. He's personally involved in your life. And then on top of all of that, He adds, SubhanAllah, He says, Wal-Furqan. And it's the, it's the distinction, the distinguisher, the separation. The separation of what? The separation of the word of human beings and the word of Allah. The separation of truth and falsehood. The separation of right and wrong. I'll tell you one story about Al-Furqan, my, one of my favorites nowadays. I'm heading to Kuwait uh, tomorrow, inshaAllah ta'ala, where there's a friend of mine, Professor Raymond Farron. I really like him. Professor Farron graduated out of Georgetown University with a PhD in Shi'ir Jahili, classical Arabic poetry. Uh, he's a white guy, with all due respect to the white guys in the audience. White guys study the weirdest things. They'll do a PhD in ant farming and do a, you know, a double PhD in like, you know, uh, this kind of plant, or that kind of cucumber. You know, and then they come on the radio, yes, I studied this plant for a long time, and it's a really quite interesting plant. I was like, why is this plant interesting to you? <laughs> Nobody else on this, in this universe cares, but you study the, you know, I studied pigeons in Southern California. Why did you study pigeons in Southern California? So they do that. They pick some weird thing and they study it until they study it more than anybody else. The world's foremost expert on thumbs or something, you know. <laughs> so he decides, being a smart white guy, that he's going to study what? Poetry. Arabic. Classical Arabic poetry. <laughs> and he does his PhD out of Georgetown in Arabic poetry. And his Arabic, his thesis, get this, his thesis was, how did the poets organize their poetry? The Qasida sometimes is very long. And his thesis was, how did they organize their poetry? There must be some system, some organization, some structure. And he presented his thesis and he, and he defended it and he got his PhD. After his PhD, he became curious if the Arab poets had an order or a structure or a layout, then this Quran thing must have some structure too. To them, the Quran is nothing more than poetry. They don't believe in it as the word of Allah. They only believe in it as some body of literature that these Arabs love. These Muslims love, that's it. So he starts studying the structure of the ayat. How are the ayat organized inside a surah? And he did this for about a year. This is about eight years ago. And he came to the conclusion that the Qur'an is so organized that it could not possibly be the effort of a human being. It has to be the word of God. He became Muslim without any da'wah ever given to him. He became Muslim. He is right now a professor of Arabic and Quranic studies and Shi'ir Jahili as a matter of fact in Kuwait at the American University of Kuwait. He's written a book on the structure of the Quran too. Okay? Raymond Farron, look him up, he's fun. Raymond Farron. Now why did I bring this up to you? By the way, it's pretty funny. When he teaches, he teaches uh, Shi'ir lil Kuwaitiyin. Right? So his, his students are Kuwaitis. Fourth year student studying Shi'a from a white guy from New Jersey. <laughs> so one of his students said, Hal nafad al Arab, shi'ar bin Amriki? <laughs> Did all the Arabs disappear? We have to learn Arabic poetry from an American? And he says, Laysa min al Arab. You guys learn English from the Arabs. It's okay. You can learn Arabic from an, from an American. It's all good. <laughs> you know? But he's, a, you know. I told you this because when somebody deeply reflects on the Qur'an and studies the Qur'an, what becomes clear to them, this is separate from any effort made by a human being. This can only be the word of Allah. You know, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Why don't they reflect deeply on the Qur'an? Had it been from someone other than Allah, they would have found a lot of contradiction. This can't be anything but. In other words, Ramadan is a time for you and me to restore our confidence in the Qur'an too. Ask questions about the Qur'an. How do you personally build a relationship with the Qur'an? How are you supposed to do that? I'm going to give you two tips. I'm going to give you two tips. 
on how you're supposed to do that, and then I'll finish this ayah. The ayah is it's an amazing ayah. We'll just finish this ayah and our talk is done tonight. So what are the two tips you can help build your relationship with the Qur'an? You've heard many pieces of advice before. This is my deviant, misguided advice. You don't, it's not Islamic at all. It's psychotic mostly. But I'll share it with you anyway. Number one, you take an ayah, you recite an ayah, you understand its meaning, and you turn it into a dua. I'll say that again. You recite an ayah, you understand its meaning, and you turn it into a what? A dua. So somebody says, how do you turn alif lam meme into a dua? Alif lam meme. No, 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 not like that. Not like that. Let me tell you how. What does alif lam meme mean? We don't know. We don't know. Ya Allah, teach me what I need to know. Ya Allah, teach me what I need to know. Ya Allah, keep me away from things that I don't need to know. Ya Allah, remind me that you know everything and I know nothing. Keep me humble in my knowledge. A dua that comes out of what? Alif lam meme. This is a book in which there is no doubt. What's a dua you can make when you read that? Ya Allah, never let me get any what? Any doubt. Hudal lil muttaqeen. It's guidance for people that have taqwa. Ya Allah, give me guidance. Ya Allah, make me from the muttaqeen. The people of taqwa. Yes? Every time you read an ayah, what can you turn it into? A dua. I will not tell you how to do that. You have to do that yourself. You have to use your mind yourself. Turn a recitation of the Qur'an into an opportunity to ask Allah. Easy. It'll make you interact with the book of Allah. That's one. I'll give you two tips. That was one. Here's the second tip. Pay attention to what you're reading. And when you pay attention, a lot of times you will not understand what Allah is saying. Why did Allah say this? How come He said that? How come He said this over here, but He said that over there? Does that ever happen to you? If you're reading Qur'an, you develop what? Questions. Write your questions down. Collect your questions about the Qur'an. Seek out their answers. Try to listen to some lecture, some book, ask an imam, something. Maybe you hear an answer that satisfies you. Maybe you hear an answer that doesn't satisfy you. And you keep seeking the answer, seeking the answer, seeking the answer, until you find the answer. And you know what that pursuit will do? That pursuit will remind you that you don't know anything. And when you find the answer, you'll find a peace in your heart that Allah's wisdom just opened up a little bit more for you. The door has been opened just a little bit more. It'll make you appreciate the power of reflection on the Qur'an. You cannot deeply reflect on the Qur'an until you learn to ask questions. You know, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ But لَا بُدَّ مِنْ سُؤَالٍ You have to ask first to have questions. So collect your questions. That will help you in your reflection. Now I'll come back to the ayah. Let's finish up the ayah. So now so far Allah has talked only about the Qur'an, hasn't He? The, I thought this talk was about Ramadan. But Allah's lecture on Ramadan in the Qur'an is Shahru Ramadan, الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان So far the entire conversation has been about the Qur'an itself. That means this month that is coming will be the greatest month of your life because you will not just fast, you will not just eat a lot of pakori and samosa and kebabs, you are going to recite more Qur'an than you ever have, think about more Qur'an than you ever have, you're gonna memorize Qur'an this year in Ramadan, you're gonna, you're gonna you know, love reciting it, love listening to it, love talking about it, love listening to its explanation, this is what you're gonna do, this is gonna be your month of Qur'an. That's what Allah wants first. Then He says, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرِ فَلْيَصُمْ then whoever gets to witness that month, then they should fast. Then he should fast. Where does taqwa live? Where does the Quran live? Where does the Quran live, guys? In the heart. These are clear ayat that live in the chests of people that have been given knowledge. You want this heart not only to have taqwa and fight your body. But to fight your body, your heart has to be strong. To be strong, your heart has to be fed. What does it have to be fed? The Qur'an. You're, you're starving your body and you're feeding your heart. That's what you're doing in Ramadan. So he says, whoever, whoever witnesses this month, then, they, then he should fast. Should I leave this license plate number? Very good. So, <laughs> I love those announcements. I'm sorry, if you own an accord, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Actually, I'm not sorry at all. But still, I'm saying that so you at least temporarily feel better. Okay. So now, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْهُ Whoever gets to witness that month among you, then, they, then he should fast. Check this out. Allah did not say, whoever lives in that month, or whoever, you should fast in that month. He said, you should witness that month. 
By the way, to witness something, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ To witness something, you have to be awake or asleep. Wait, 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 let me say that again. To witness something, you have to be what? Awake. Oh, so you have to be awake in Ramadan? Yeah? You sure Bahrain? You sure you understand what I'm saying to you? You have suhoor, then you pass out, then you wake up for dhuhr, and you pass out, then you wake up for asr, and you pass out, then you're really awake for maghrib. And then you eat so much you can't stand in, in salah. Oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> If you want the most out of the month of Ramadan, you have to go out of your way to stay what? Ah, shahida min kumu shahra. Don't spend your day sleeping. Don't spend your day. Ah, I love the teenagers. They're the best. They pass out like they're dying, and then they wake up. Is it time yet? No. <laughs> so useless. God, do something with your life. Stay awake in Ramadan. Don't sleep too much. You can sleep the rest of your life. This is, the, this is the month where all humanity is supposed to wake up. The Muslims should not be sleeping. The Muslims should be awake. Allah will give you energy. Don't worry about the energy. Brother, but it's so hard for me. I can't fast. Well, my energy goes away. Shut up! <laughs> Just do it. Allah will give you energy. Stop making excuses. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْ Now let me go back. I told you something. Before Ramadan, was there fasting? Yes? How many options did you have if you missed a fast? What were those two options, ladies and gentlemen? You could make it up or feed a poor person. Yes? Two options, which was pretty easy. Now Allah says, فَمَنْ كَانَ مُرِيدًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرْ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنَ يَامٍ أُخَرْ Whoever was traveling or sick, they have to make it up. Which means option, how many options? There's no second option. Before it used to be a few days, now it's 30 days, which means it got harder. Before you had two options to get away with it, now you have only one option, which means he became even harder. Things are getting easier or harder? They're getting harder. Now, after they get harder, he says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرِ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعَسْرِ Man, this can only be kalam Allah. <laughs> he says, Allah wants things to be easy for you. You know, like I'll say it in Urdu, se baitho. Chill out. Allah wants things to be easy for you. He doesn't want difficulty for you. Because the moment you read that, the first thought that comes in your head is, head is, Ya Allah, things just got a little tougher. Allah says, no, I want things to be easy for you. So I want you to understand what He means. Because clearly everything is getting harder. But He's saying the opposite. He's saying things are getting what? Easier. So let's understand why. How could He, how could he solve this contradiction? It's easy. There's a, there are two students in the college. One of them studies every day. Every day. The other one never studies. One of them graduates on time, the other one graduates much later. The one who didn't, did not study, what was he doing? If he was not studying, what was he doing? Fooling around, sleeping, playing video games, sports, movies, whatever, right? And the guy who was studying was having the hardest time, wasn't he? He wants to watch a movie too. He wants to go play too. He wants to sleep too, but he's staying awake and he's studying. This one is going through difficulty and this one is going through what? Ease. But when the student who worked hard graduated, his life was a lot easier. And when the student who didn't put the work in, later in the same years, his life is what? A lot harder. There are two people. One of them exercises every day. Eats right every day. Chocolate looks at him and he doesn't eat it. And then there's his brother who says, Ah, dummy, eat whatever you want. Exercise, come on man, who needs that? You need Allah who al yusr. Doesn't exercise, yes? They're the same age, they're, maybe, they're both 18 years old. And one of them takes care of himself, the other one does not take... By, by the way, is it easy to take care of yourself? No, it's a sacrifice, isn't it? It's pain and endurance, isn't it? Okay. 30 years later, both of those 18 year old men, one of them is 48, the other one is 48, yes? But one of them can still walk like this. And the other one? One of them looks lean. The other one looks like a snake just swallowed a goat. 
One of them sits down on the plane comfortably, the other one sits down and he doesn't have to put the tray table down, there's already a tray table here. <laughs> you can just put the food on there, it's fine, it's pretty, pretty even surface. <laughs> one of them is going to have diabetes, high blood pressure, back problems, blood, heart problems, yes or no? And the other one's going to be playing tennis. Isn't it? Yes. So he went through difficulty in the beginning, and as a result, he enjoyed long-term ease. Yes? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Allah made Ramadan tougher because He wants your life to be what? Easier. Learn taqwa here so you can save yourself for 11 months. It'll be better for you. Because when you save yourself from haram, when you save yourself from sin, when you save yourself from forgetting Allah, then your life becomes easier. Allah opens more doors of risk. Allah makes your health better. Allah makes your family better. Allah makes your relationships with your kids better. He even makes your wife nicer. I know, it's possible. <laughs> Allah wants ease for you, my friend. Allah doesn't just say Allah wants ease for you in fasting. Allah wants ease for you in everything in your life. You give him a good Ramadan and he will give you a good everything else. Everything else. You're, you'll study math better. You'll start making friends, even you. You know? Some of you are, you don't know how to speak, you have no confidence. You'll start gaining confidence. Your health will get better. Everything about your life will get better if you give Allah his due. He wants you to have ease. And on top of that, not only will He give you ease in this life, He will also give you ease in the next life. And that's why He gave you this month. Well, I mean, it, this month has a lot of benefits. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرِ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرِ Now we're coming to the conclusion of this ayah, and it gets even more epic. It's so easy to understand, but I'm not going to give you like an academic way of understanding it. I'll give you a silly way of understanding it so you remember. 30 days of training, isn't it? 30 days of training. You know the police academy also has training. The military also has training. Athletes also have training. You know if you have a certification in some kind of technology, you also get a training, yes? And these trainings, you have to have a certain amount of attendance. And you have to get a certain score. 